1997 was a banner year for World Championship Wrestling. Just about everything seemed to click for the Bischoff-led promotion, which was well on top in the Monday Night Wars thanks to the continued success of the New World Order, as well as other must-see attractions like the revolutionary Cruiserweight division. Not every decision was a right one, as not every show was a slam dunk, of course, something that became clear when watching WCW pay-per-views, which played host to as much great wrestling as they did boneheaded booking. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is every WCW pay-per-view of 1997 ranked from worst to best. Join us. Number 12, Sold Out. Heading into 1997, the New World Order was, indisputably, the hottest thing in pro wrestling. So you can see the logic behind giving the Renegade group their very own pay-per-view, right? Regrettably, Sold Out was a case of a good idea in theory totally not panning out in practice. It had a cool look, yes, and the concept was at least different, but the action and booking left a lot to be desired. The opener between NWO Japan member Masahiro Chono and WCW's Chris Jericho was perfectly decent, if not a little long-winded. The NWO's Big Bubba then literally ran over WCW's Hugh Morris to win their Mexican Deathmatch, which was far from the worst thing in the world, but not exactly a thriller. It was, however, positively exhilarating in comparison with Jeff Jarrett's victory over Michael Wall Street, which brought the score to 2-1 in favour of the NWO. The American Males exploded next as Buff Bagwell beat Scotty Riggs in a match that just wasn't very good and lasted around three or four minutes too long. Scott Norton beat Diamond Dallas Page by count out after DDP had laid waste to the NWO B squad after faking joining the group himself. The Steiners beat the Outsiders to bag the WCW tag team titles in a match that was mostly alright but dragged in the middle. Eric Bischoff, who had been doing his best to irritate viewers as an event host and commentator all night, would reverse the decision the next night on Nitro. In the best match of the night, Eddie Guerrero bested Sean Six Waltman to retain his US title in a ladder match. They were a little unsure on how to work the stipulation to its fullest since neither man had been in a ladder match before, but it was still very exciting and the most enjoyable thing on this show by a couple million miles. Then in the main event, WCW World Champion Hulk Hogan went to a no contest with recent NWO defector the Giant in your textbook Hogan vs. the Giant main event. I've always hated textbooks. Number 11, Star arcade. For almost 18 months, WCW expertly built anticipation for Sting to take on and defeat NWO leader Hulk Hogan for the WCW world title. The main event of Starcade 1997 should have been an easy to execute home run, setting WCW up for continued success going forward. Well, that didn't work for someone, brother, so instead we got one of the most bungled finishes of all time. Accounts vary as to the what and the why, but essentially Sting got screwed over by a master politician who engineered an ending to make sure that he looked strong and his opponent looked like a face-painted idiot. Sting walked away with the belt, sure, but the match had totally lacked the spark fans anticipated after such a great storyline and the fast count that wasn't a fast count followed by a restart only caused confusion. But hey, how had the show been leading up to the anticlimactic headliner, eh? Well, not great to be honest. It started well enough with Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko tussling for the Cruiserweight title. Granted, it wasn't their very best match, but Guerrero and Malenko under par is still above average for most. The NWO threesome of Randy Savage, Scott Norton and Vincent then beat the Steiners and Ray Trailer in a pretty random but not totally worthless six-man. Goldberg's victory over Steve McMichael was, on the other hand, almost totally worthless. Saturn then beat Chris Benoit in a surprisingly lethargic Ravens rules match before Buff Bagwell beat Lex Luger in a match that was, I kid you not, almost 20 boring minutes too long. You could watch literally any episode of The Simpsons, seasons 1-9 to nine, naturally, and have a better time. DDP beat Kurt Hennig to win the US title in a halfway decent match before the hot garbage that was Eric Bischoff vs Larry Zbysko for control of Nitro or something which the living legend won by DQ. Never forget that this is how WCW chose to use the red hot Bret Hart, fresh off being screwed in Montreal who acted as special guest referee for this match and then got involved in the main event. And people wonder why he always rags on Bischoff and WCW management for not having a clue. 
Number 10, Road Wild. Changing the name from Hog Wild after Harley Davidson threatened to sue didn't make WCW's Sturgis Bike Rally pay-per-view any better, though it was worth a watch overall. Kicking things off in no style at all was a run-of-the-mill tag match between Harlem Heat and Vicious and Delicious. Conan gobbled up Rey Mysterio in a match that was very dull for one featuring Mysterio in this era. Conversely, this was about as exciting as things got when it came to K-Dog. Benoit and Mongo then beat Jara and Malenko in an elimination tag match, which was more about the tension between Double J and the Iceman than it was about the wrestling, which was just alright. Alex Wright retained his Cruiserweight title against Chris Jericho in a match that took a minute or two to get going, but turned out rather well in the end. Ric Flair then beat Six in what might have been the match of the night. That's not to say it was magnificent or anything, but compared with some of the lazy performances on this show, it certainly stood out. Fair play to Hennig and DDP too, who also didn't phone it in and had a canny little contest before the Giant beat Savage in a short outing. The Steiners probably should have regained the double straps from the Outsiders, but WCW opted instead for a disappointing DQ finish. And in the main event, Hulk Hogan won back the WCW world title and ended Lex Luger's reign at a mammoth five days. I mean, it's Hogan and Luger in 1997, so you're not expecting a clinic or anything, but this was still a humdrum way to end a pay-per-view. Number 9, World War 3. As per bastard usual, the titular World War 3 match, a 60-man three-ring battle royal, was barely watchable tripe. But that's not to say the show itself was bad, far from it in fact. It didn't get off to the most inspired start with the Faces of Fear beating Ernest Miller and Glacier, though Saturn's TV title defense against Disco Inferno was better than you would expect. Yuji Nagata then beat Ultimo Dragon in a predictably solid scrap, with hometown heroes the Steiners getting a popular win over William Regal and Dave Taylor in what was a bit of a styles clash, but intriguing in its own way. Raven beat Riggs in a Raven's Rules match. You've seen one, you've pretty much seen them all. Steve McMichael got out of Goldberg duty via the trusty method of knocking him out with a lead pipe and took on Alex Wright instead. Stealing the show were Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio, who played another blinder with the Cruiserweight title on the line. People rightfully celebrate their all-time classic from the previous month's Halloween Havoc, but this is no slouch and something of a hidden gem for those who have yet to discover it. And Kurt Hennig retained his US title against Ric Flair in a no-holds-barred encounter that was a little long and lulled at times, but on the whole was worth the time. Number 8. Uncensored The only way was up for WCW Uncensored after the abomination that was the 1996 edition. And you know what? Giving Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko's US title opener 20 minutes to play with is a surefire way to immediately get yourself in my good graces. They used every minute in a captivating contest, even if WCW kept cutting to backstage shenanigans and the finish, which saw Malenko win the title, was far from clean. Ably following Eddie and Dean were Ultimo Dragon and Psychosis, despite them having no real reason to wrestle each other and the crowd not being very into it. Mortis, the masked canyon, did all he could do to drag Glacier into something decent in their martial arts challenge match and succeeded in doing so. Seriously, who was better than Canyon? Not Buff Bagwell or Scotty Riggs, that's for sure. Their strap match was so one-sided and dull that I'm retroactively going to start calling them the American Lanes from this day forward. It's an anagram, do you get it? The tornado tag between Harlem Heat and Public Enemy was fun trash, while poor Rey Mysterio was saddled with lame duck TV champion Prince Ikea. Even Rey, who was on fire in this era, couldn't get anything out of it. And in the odd three-team main events, the NWO, Hogan Savage, Nash and Hall, outlasted Team Piper, Hot Rod Mongo, Jara and Benoit, and the numerically disadvantaged Team WCW, Luger, The Giant, and Scott Steiner. Convoluted and not exactly engaging, it basically devolved into a glorified battle royal, though luckily Sting was on hand to send the fans home happy. Number 7, The Great American Bash The 1997 Great American Bash provided truth in advertising. It was pretty great. Bashing one out in the opening contest was Psychosis and Ultimo Dragon, a pair of exciting flyers who always worked well together. Harlem Heat and the Steiners also had consistent chemistry and put together a surly scrap that was annoyingly cheapened by a weak DQ finish. Worst match of the night dishonors went to Conan and Hugh Morris. Ten minutes of total tedium. Glacier's victory over Ram was more than marginally better as both men put a shift in. In the final 
final WCW women's title match, it was a thing, honest. Akira Hokuto retained against Medusa, who put her wrestling career on the line in one of the in-ring highlights of the show. Chris Benoit made Meng pass out to win their death match. You will be surprised to find out they beat the living hell out of each other for the 15 minutes they were out there, though it did linger a little in spots. In something of a minor miracle, Mongo and football player Kevin Green were able to string together something competent that bordered on the entertaining. The Outsiders' tag title defense against Ric Flair and Roddy Piper, meanwhile, was a bit of a chore. And in the ultra-intense main event, Randy Savage beat Diamond Dallas Page in a gripping Falls Count Anywhere match that more than deserved its top billing. Number 6. Slamboree Slamboree 1997 started with a real corker as Steven Regal challenged Ultimo Dragon for the World TV title. Their unique styles meshed wonderfully and they had the crowd with them for all 16 minutes before Sonny Ono turned on his charge and Regal walked away with the belt. That was followed by a short but spirited clash between Medusa and Luna Vachon in Luna's sole televised WCW outing. The eclectic undercard continued as Rey Mysterio battled Yuji Yashiroka, a little-known prospect from Japan's war, wrestle and romance promotion. A random match for a pay-per-view, yes, but the two gelled nicely and made good use of their 15 minutes. Mortis and Glacier was more of an angle with the rest of the Blood Runs Cold Gang than an actual match. Dean Malenko and Jeff Jarrett picked things back up with a sterling US title match that saw the Man of a Thousand Holds retain. The death match between Meng and Chris Benoit was better than the one they would have a month later at The Bash. The Steiner brothers beat Conan and Hugh Morris in a fair effort. And hey, remember a minute or two ago when I said Mongo got a good match out of Kevin Green. Well, he did the exact opposite with Reggie White here. 15 minutes they gave him. 15 whole minutes. And in the main event, Kevin Green, Ric Flair and Roddy Piper beat the NWO trio of Hall, Nash and Six in a rollicking six-man. A nice varied card with a little bit of everything. Do not sleep on Slamboree 97. Number 5. Spring Stampede Another decent, if not entirely world-beating pay-per-view from the first half of 97, Spring Stampede Stampede was another show that had a little bit of something for everyone. And everyone should enjoy and appreciate the opener between Rey Mysterio and Ultimo Dragon, a typically tasty blend of the Lucha and Japanese styles from two of their best practitioners. Akira then retained her WCW women's title, it was a real thing, honest, against, who else, Medusa in a brief yet fiery outing. Steve Regal dragged TV champ Iakea to a respectable match, though the Lord couldn't wrangle the belt off the Prince. Public Enemy beat Mongo and Jeff Jarrett in a poor tag match, before Booker T cut an infamous backstage promo on Hulk Hogan, which is easily the most memorable thing about this show. Dean Malenko's US title defense against Chris Benoit by rights should have been better better and in conversation for best bout honours, but it fell oddly below expectation. Nash steamrolled Rick Steiner in a singles match for the tag team titles. Big Sexy's hair looked immaculate as it always did. Lex Luger became number one contender to Hogan's WCW world title in a disjointed four-way with the Giants and both members of Harlem Heat. And closing us out with gusto were long-term rivals Randy Savage and Diamond Dallas Page, who gave it their all in giving fans a proper romper stomper of a curtain closer. Number four, Bash at the Beach. We've already bashed like great Americans, so now it's time to bash one off at the beach. A favourite summer pastime of mine, let me tell you. Blood ran cold in the opener as Mortis and Wrath beat Ernest Miller and Glacier in a so-so match. I get what WCW were going for with this diet Mortal Kombat deal, but they never quite got to where they wanted to be. A much better choice for a hot opener would have been Chris Jericho's cruiserweight title defence against Ultimo Dragon. These two knew each other well from previous battles in Japan, and their familiarity and chemistry shone through in a high-flying match. Not much flying going on when the Steiners met NWO Japan's Masahiro Chono and the Great Muta, but it was a suitably strong style affair. Back to the skies in the next match though, as Hector Garza, Juventud Guerrero and Liz Mark Jr. beat La Parker, Psychosis and Viano 4 in an enthusiastic car crash style lucha exhibition. Chris Benoit beat fierce rival Kevin Sullivan in a stiff retirement match brawl, and he never wrestled again. Jeff Jarrett retained his US title against Steve McMichael. Not much to this one, really. There was a bit more to Savage and Hall's victory over DDP and surprise partner Kurt Hennig, even if they did milk the stalling a little bit at the beginning and never seemed to get out of second gear. Roddy Piper beat Ric Flair in 
a typical Piper versus Flair match, chops, kicks, some shenanigans at the finish could almost set your watch by it. And in the main event, Luger and the Giant beat Hogan and Dennis Rodman in Rodzilla's first pro match. Fine for what it was, it was still a bit too long and faltered once the novelty of Rodman hitting a leapfrog and arm drag had worn off. Number 3. Super Brawl Roddy Piper spent a week in Alcatraz to prepare himself for his WCW title match with Hulk Hogan at Super Brawl 97. I'd have thought some cardio, weight training, and maybe a strict diet plan might have been more effective, but each to their own. Hot Rod's stay on the notorious former prison island sadly didn't aid him in his quest, as he was pretty much screwed out of a title win by Randy Savage, who aided his frenemy and officially joined the New World Order. They tried to create the big fight atmosphere, I'll give them that, but like umpteen WCW pay-per-view main events from the NWO era, it failed to follow through. Thank goodness for the undercard then, with two dependables, Malenko and Waltman, giving us an appetizing opener, followed by a frenetic Lucha six-man featuring Conan, Juventud, La Parker, and some other guys. Prince Ikea retained his TV title against Rey Mysterio in a fair match. A notch below Rey's usual, yes, but not actively bad or anything. DDP and Buff Bagwell didn't spark, nor surprisingly did Jericho and Guerrero in their US title showdown. Don't get me wrong, the wrestling was lovely and all, but the crowd could hardly muster an applause. The triangle tag bouts with Harlem Heat's public enemy and the faces of fear could have been the mother of all styles clashes, but it turned out well enough and didn't outstay its welcome. Jeff Jarrett led Steve McMichael to a satisfactory outing, his victory ensuring that he stayed in the Four Horsemen. Chris Benoit beat Kevin Sullivan in a sprawling San Francisco death match, and then the Giant and Luger beat the Outsiders to win the tag straps in a good match. Eric Bischoff, always one to poop on a party, declared the result null the following night on Nitro. I mean, that's why you order pay-per-views, isn't it? To watch matches that have their results rendered pointless on television 24 hours later. Number 2. Halloween Havoc The gulf between WCW's hard-working mid-card crew and the aging main event force was laid bare at Halloween Havoc 1997. In the show's main event, you had what was dubbed, not by WCW, mind you, the age in the cage as Piper once again clashed with Hogan. The title wasn't on the line, so you could already tell where this was going, a Piper win, but the journey to get there was nonsensical and downright awful, featuring pitiful action and Randy Savage almost ending his career by jumping from the top of the ludicrously tall structure. The show's third match, however, was not only the best match of the night, it was one of WCW's best matches ever. The antithesis of Hogan and Piper, Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio went balls to the wall for 14 breathtaking minutes in their rightly vaunted mask versus title match. In and of itself, that match makes the show worth sitting through, but there's some other good stuff to be found as well. For example, the opener between Yuji Nagata and Ultimo Dragon, or the sudden death match between Savage and DDP. There was merit to Jericho's thrown together match with Gado and Flair and Hennig's US title tussle too. Not so good were Alex Wright versus Steve McMichael or Lex Luger against Scott Hall. And as for Disco Inferno's loss to Jacqueline? Pretty awful, all things considered, but also kind of funny because Disco was basically forced to do the job after initially protesting in order to keep his job. Number 1. Fall Brawl A tip-top show from top to bottom, there was nary a dud in sight at Fall Brawl 97. In the opener, Eddie Guerrero beat Chris Jericho to win his first Cruiserweight title. As excellent as you would expect, this incorporated great Matt Red wrestling with flying, hard strikes, and big suplexes, keeping fans guessing right up until the three count. The shredded Guerrero, Shreddy Guerrero, was really finding his groove around this time, and Jericho was no slouch either. The crowd were bang into the solid battle between the Steiners and Harlem Heat. You knew exactly what you were getting here, but all four men were motivated, and it turned out to be one of the more heated matches in their lengthy series. The crowd mellowed a little for Alex Wright's TV title defense against Ultimo Dragon, but you can't fall the action, which was tremendous. Jeff Jarrett beat Dean Malenko in another rewarding duel, giving Double J a future shot at the US title. Wrath and Mortis got a big win over the Faces of Fear in a good match. The Giant then mowed through Scott Norton before Paige and Luger teamed up to take on Savage and Hall. They didn't reinvent the wheel and the finish was a little hokey, but they accomplished what they needed to. And in the main event, Team NWO beat the Four Horsemen in Horseman Country, no less, in the annual War Games match when Kurt Hennig betrayed his squad and joined the order. Not the best war games match you'll ever see, but certainly gratifying, even if the finish did leave a sour taste in the mouth at the time.